Welcome to our service. My name is Jim Conkle, and I'm the associate pastor at our Jennersville campus and the pastor of our Celebrate Recovery Ministry. I'm so glad you're joining us today, and if you're tuning in for the first time, or if you've recently joined our online community, we would love to get to know you. So please take a moment to visit our website. Click the I'm New button to learn a little bit more about us. But while you're there, fill out our connections card and tell us how we might help you get connected into our church family. Now, before we continue in our series, the place to be, the Acts 2 community, and hear a message from our senior pastor, Greg Lafferty. In John chapter 14, we are encouraged to let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. I am the way and the truth and the life. Would you join me as we sing and proclaim this gospel truth together?
Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you everyone. It's great to have you with us today, and I want to take us straight to our preaching text, Acts 2, 42 to 47. We've read it before. We're going to read it again, and uh, it's just a beautiful description of the first Christian church. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Everyone was filled with awe. And many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And not only is this the word of the Lord, this is the place to be. That's what we're calling our teaching series these days, the place to be. Because the place where God dwells in fullness, well, it's a place where the Spirit dwells. It's a place where the gospel rules. It's a place where the prayers flow, where the fellowship is rich, where people really care, where gladness just lifts and inspires everybody. That's our preaching topics in this series. We're taking them one by one. We're going to talk today about the place where the gospel rules. But this is just what happens when God comes in fullness to his people. And he did it on the day of Pentecost. And he does it again in various times and places all throughout history. He revives a people. And revival is the subtext of this teaching series. You know, Peter had said in Acts 2.39, as he's proclaiming the gospel that first Pentecost day, he said, now this promise of the outpouring of the Spirit, uh, this, this is not just for us. This is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. For all whom our Lord God will draw, the promise of life and joy in God's Spirit, it's for everyone. And we need fresh outpourings of it. We so want to be in this place. And not only that, but by God's grace, just to be this place. And and so we need a fresh outpouring of God's Spirit. And, And here's why. Here's the reality about ourselves. We have the gospel. In fact, we have the very life of God inside us. And that is awesome. It's like a new core processor. But the problem is it's been installed inside of old hardware that's trying to run a bunch of old, outdated, glitchy software. We've got God in these bodies and brains. And we are not resurrected yet. We are not fully transformed. And Paul puts it this way. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Now, who stores a treasure in jars of clay? Like, literally. No, if you've got a treasure, you put it in, you know, a bank vault or a steel safe. Or, you know, if you've got something to put inside, you know, your bodies, your temple, you'd hope to have a superhero body. We've got none of that stuff. We've got the treasure in a jar of clay. We leak. 
we break and we need more of God. Just, just like the Acts 2 church did and just like they saw it. You know, the amazing thing about this event on Pentecost is that the big festival in Jerusalem ended like it always does after about a week and everybody goes back home. But this time, at least these people, nobody went back home. 3,000 people are still in the, the small, less than one square mile ancient city of Jerusalem. And because they've been in the place where God dwells and they don't want to leave. In fact, they want more. They're just coming, seeking more from God, just like we want to seek more from God. And, and the first thing they seek is teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and at the same time, to the fellowship. Now, they devoted themselves, as we can see and as we read, to things other than that, but I want to start right there. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. These two things right away, and they, they cohere together like sides of a coin. Uh, Ray Ortland, uh, who has so informed my thought on this, I am so uh, just indebted to Ray Ortland for a whole lot of what I'm sharing in this sermon. Um, Ray Ortland calls it gospel doctrine and gospel culture. And any legitimate church is just full of both gospel doctrine and gospel culture. Francis Schaeffer, a, a Christian pastor and thinker before Ray Ortland, who greatly influenced his thinking, he calls it orthodoxy of doctrine and orthodoxy of community. In fact, let me read you a quote from the great Francis Schaeffer, uh, and he's commenting on Acts 2. He says, one cannot explain the explosive dynamic of the early church, apart from the fact that they practiced two things simultaneously, orthodoxy of doctrine and orthodoxy of community, a community which the world could see. By the grace of God, therefore, the church today must be known simultaneously for its purity of doctrine and the reality of its community. Our churches have so often been only preaching points with very little emphasis on community. But exhibition of the love of God in practice is beautiful and must be there. And he's exactly right. It is beautiful and it must be there. Gospel culture, orthodoxy of community, it must be there. Not just so that a church can grow and thrive, but so that a church can be legitimately the church in the first place. They go together. And so these early believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. And, you know, I'm, I'm struck straight away just by the fact that they devoted themselves. Nobody had to cajole or guilt these people into this. They just spontaneously gave themselves to this. I mean, it just never occurred to them that, hey, now that we've become Christians, let's make sure that we squeeze a little more Jesus into the margins of our lives. They just didn't think that way. They didn't think that Jesus was one of many good weekend options. They didn't experience Jesus as someone who came into their solid, decent, level six lives and, and upgraded them to a seven or an eight. That's not how they experienced God and the gospel. No, he just blew into their world with fresh wind and fresh fire. The love of God just erupted in their souls like a geyser of joy and grace, faith, hope, and love. Jesus just became for them this weighty center around which everybody just naturally began to orbit their lives. And they wanted more. So the festival of Pentecost ends, the exhibitors and most people go home, but not these people. They stay, and the first thing they want more of is, you could say, gospel doctrine. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So let's just talk about gospel doctrine for a moment. You know, it's like they just understood, maybe with fresh new insight, 
What God had said through Moses hundreds of years earlier, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Or, or maybe, you know, they learned the words that Jesus spoke maybe just months earlier where he said, it's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words I've spoken to you are spirit and life. And these people have tasted and seen that it's good. It's like, we like us some spirit and life. And so we need more word. And they just show up at the apostles' doorsteps like the next day saying, hey, we're, we're here for more. We want to hear it all. We want to learn it all. We want the whole story of Jesus. We want every miracle he ever did, every sermon he ever preached, heck, every conversation he ever held. We want to understand how Jesus fulfills every prophecy of the Messiah in the Old Testament. And hey, if Jesus had any prophetic words to say about our future, we really need to know those. So we just want to know it all. Go. And 3,000 people are just devoted to the apostles' teaching. And I guess these guys are probably like, well, I think this is where our teaching ministry begins. And they just start meeting, like all over town. You know, Peter's holding a Bible study at Liberty Market, and James is at Filter, and John is at Tallulah's Table. Matthew's over at La Verona. Simon the Zealot's over on that nice little outdoor plaza next to it. Andrew, you know, he's the sensitive soul, and he loves young families and kids. He's like, I'll tell you what, I'll take all the, the young families over to Nixon Park so that the kids can play while we talk. And, and if it's ever raining, we'll just go to McDonald's Playland. And, and they're, just, they're just teaching this crowd because this crowd wants to know. They want to absorb from the Word of God life and grace and sustaining energies. This is what Jude says in the New Testament about how this works and, and what we're seeking for together. It says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, which faith comes by hearing the word of God, and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. I mean, it's earnest prayer, word and prayer, that just keeps us in the flow, in the experience of, of the life of God and the love of God. That's why we, as whenever we're in the position of hearer and learner, we want to be real earnest about that. And people like me, entrusted with teaching the Bible and delivering a sermon every week, well, here's how Paul charges the likes of us. He says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And the mystery of this is that it's not just that initial preaching of the gospel and that initial receiving of it that saves us, it does. But a persevere, a saving faith, a real saving faith is a persevering faith. It will keep going. And that faith is sustained by a strong, healthy, ongoing diet of the Word of God. We who teach it have to teach it faithfully, and all of us must take it in and hunger for it. And you know, when God moves in a fresh way to bring about like revival, in a community, it invariably begins with a real hunger for God's Word. I want to share with you a couple of stories from the history of revival, outpourings of God in various times and places. Uh, one in Scotland in the 1800s, Charles Brown, a minister there, reported this. It was a common thing. As soon as the Bible was opened, after the preliminary services and just as the reader began, for great meltings to come upon the hearers, the deepest attention was paid to every word as the sacred verses were slowly and solemnly enunciated. Then the silent tear might be seen stealing down the rugged but expressive countenances of any number of people. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. Robert Murray McShane, a famous Scottish preacher who experienced the same revival, says this, observing it, I've discovered nothing peculiar or different in the work of the ministers. They were doing what they always did. Yet I have observed an awful and breathless stillness 
pervading the assembly. Each hearer bent forward in the posture of rapt attention. Somehow, the Word of God becomes precious beyond measure when God revives a people. Gospel doctrine is something they're hungry for. Thomas Nelson, he held revival meetings in coal mining villages in England about the same time. And he says, on some occasions, the colliers, that's the coal miners, must come black to the preaching or else miss the sermon. They're like covered in black. They don't even have time to wash. And when the Lord warms their hearts with his dying love and they feel him precious in his word, the large silent tears rolling conspicuously down their black cheeks and leaving clean streaks portray what their hearts feel. The refreshing cleansing of the word of God. And gospel doctrine does that. And when God revives a people, they just yearn for that more and more. May God open us to that. May he keep us faithful in the normal times to gospel doctrine. But may he, in our day, maybe in weeks and months ahead, give us this kind of eager desire, this earnest listening to the word all the time. It'd be a great sign of revival. But then, receiving gospel doctrine over and over again, that issues forth in gospel culture, in a community, not just an orthodox believing community, but an orthodoxy of community together. So let's talk about gospel culture. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. And that fellowship had, had a culture and an ethos about it. There was reverence and awe. There was gladness as the people shared meals together. There was great and tangible care and concern. Whatever needs people had, others were earnest and eager to fill them. It was a place that was like loving, not just nice, way beyond nice. I mean, sometimes we can think of like the culture of a church. It's got to be a nice culture. I mean, that's just, that's just basic. I mean, we do believe that God has been nice to us in Christ. And so we have to be nice to each other, but it might be nothing more than this like superficial glaze that is over top of our fiery preaching or our passionate politics or our rigid moralism. You know, we can sometimes just be nice because like, well, in retail, it's just good business. You gotta be nice to your customers or they're not gonna come back. But hey, we wanna go beyond that because nobody actually believes in that. I mean, even at Chick-fil-A, when you say thank you and they say my pleasure, you don't really believe that, do you? They're saying that because corporate told them to. We appreciate the, 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 the gesture, but it doesn't feel like legit. Hey, by the way, Deanna and I went to Chick-fil-A just last week and they didn't say my pleasure. I don't know if it was just this person's lapse or if the culture's changing, but I was shocked and appalled. Not really, but you know, we don't believe that it's their pleasure anyway. But oh, when we get to serve each other or care for each other, and if we were ever even to say my pleasure, we would want it to have this deep ring of truth about it. We want our culture and community to cohere with our message and our doctrine. Because do we or do we not believe that the risen ascended Christ is actually poured out into us by the Holy Spirit? We believe that, right? We believe that is real reality. We have real reality with the living Christ. Well, my goodness, Jesus came full of grace and truth. Jesus said, describing his own heart, I'm gentle and lowly in heart. Jesus, the friend of sinners. Jesus, the one who touched lepers. Jesus, the one who welcomed children. Jesus, the one who would stop the whole parade to attend to a blind man crying out for mercy. That Jesus lives among us. And if he does, it's going to be felt and experienced in our culture. Now, let's not assume, though, that that's the way it's going to be. 
because it can go sideways and sometimes in hideous ways. I mean, I came across this picture. It's a church in Oregon about a hundred years ago. Can you imagine? I mean, you know, when Jesus threatens to spit some churches out of his mouth in the book of Revelation, I think he was talking about this one. Can you imagine having Jesus saves on your wall and these hooded goofs in front of your church? God help us. Now, I am so thankful. I don't think any of us have ever failed that dramatically. But we might ask ourselves honestly, like, is our culture matching our doctrine? Do we have a thin icing layer of nice? Or do we have the depths of love for one another as as we could and ought? I want to just take you to three examples uh, in the Bible of what gospel culture based on gospel doctrine looks like. Here's the first one. 1 Peter 1, 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, that's gospel doctrine, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Deep love, real love, full love. When your heart goes out to other people, that's normal in the church. A love that just pervades everything. Uh, Paul calls it in one place, the aroma of Christ. Not that strange funk you smell when you walk into some places, but like, you know, when you walk in, it's like fresh baked bread or grilling meat. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is so good. That's what we want people to smell and begin to taste the moment they come into our midst. Here's what that kind of a loving culture is like. It involves grace and safety and time, or gospel plus safety plus time. This is Ray Ortland. He wrote a great blog post on this, and uh, this is what he says. Gospel plus safety plus time. It's what everyone needs. A lot of gospel plus a lot of safety plus a lot of time gospel. Good news for bad people through the finished work of Christ on the cross and the endless power of the Holy Spirit. Multiple exposures, constant immersion, wave upon wave of grace and truth according to the Bible. Safety, a non-accusing environment, no embarrassing anyone, no cornering anyone, no shaming, but respect and sympathy, and listening, and understanding, so that people can exhale, and open up, and unburden their souls. A church environment where no one seeking the Lord has anything to fear. Time. No pressure. Not even self-imposed pressure. No deadlines on growth. Urgency, but not hurry, because no one changes quickly. A lot of space for complicated people to rethink their lives at a deep level. God is patient. This is what our churches must be. Gentle environments of gospel plus safety plus time. It's where we finally are free to grow. Oh, that is so good. And I so want Willowdale to be that way. I know you do too. And think about how that might work its way out. Just in how we deal with one another as, you know, recidivist sinners, repeat offenders all the time. It's got to be a lot of gospel and safety and time. Yeah, I happened to come across this, just a little sidebar anecdote in a podcast I was listening to uh, maybe about a month ago. Uh, But it was a comment about how people quit smoking. And a person was really making, you know, the Uh, sharing the notion that we just need a lot of time and patience with each other. They said, you know, a study was done on when people quit smoking. And on average, they are successful on their ninth attempt. They try and fail eight times on average the ninth. I mean, some people might go faster. Others are going to take even longer than that. And you know, if you have a friend who's trying to quit smoking, my wife has a friend who's trying to quit smoking. And, and, and tends to keep going back. You know, we could get real frustrated with that or we could just say, oh, 
I know you're frustrated. I feel for you. I know you're smoking again and I you can tell you're embarrassed. Hey, it's hard. I can only imagine. I love you and care about you anyway. No worries. Imagine what kind of space and comfort and safety and time that person's provided versus what I would be inclined to do and what we sometimes do in the church with people, whatever their sin issue. It's like, you did that again? What is wrong with you? Obey the gospel. No, no, it doesn't work that way. It's got to be, it's got to be a lot of gospel and safety and, and time. It's the sense that we're impatient with people that keeps them away from us. Like one person said, you know, whenever we get into trouble, we ought to be sprinting to church rather than avoiding it until we get our Instagrammable Christianity back. Isn't that how so many people feel? But no, it's when we're in need and when we're in crisis, it's like the church is the first place I can go because they're going to love me deeply from the heart. And this whole place is gospel plus safety plus time. And boy, do I need some of that. So that's one verse about gospel culture. Take a look at Hebrews 10. Familiar verses. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Like the day, the end of the world day. The day of the Lord approaching. Now, we're, we're called to, our translation says, spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And it got me thinking, can you actually spur somebody to love and good deeds? Can you actually jab something sharp into their hindquarters and make them do it? Can you yell and guilt and cajole people into love? Well, we all will instinctively say, no, you can't, although I have to admit, I try regularly because I got children who are given to something other than love and good deeds at times. And you know what I try to do? Yell them into love and good deeds. I'm not very effective at it. It doesn't work. But when I'm a gentler, wiser dad and I slow down a little bit, what I might do instead is like pull one aside and say, just in a whisper, giving them some space and letting them take the next action as if of their own accord. I might just whisper like, hey, you know what would be awesome? Let's not do A. Let's do B. And I might say that not even correcting bad behavior when I'm really on my game as a dad. I'll do something like that proactively. Like, hey, sweetie, you know what would be awesome? You ought to go into the kitchen right now and say, mom, can I help set the table? She would love that. It's a good idea. And now I've sent them off into love and good deeds. Um, more biblically, because, you know, the word actually says stimulate or provoke or, or incite love and good deeds. You don't spur those things, but I can stimulate them. And hey, we come together to encourage this in everyone. I love this. It says don't give up meeting together as some sadly are in the habit of doing but encourage one another. The opposite of skipping church is not coming to church. The opposite of skipping church is encouraging one another. We don't skip church so that we might encourage one another. The implication here is that just your very presence is an encouragement, let alone if you actually lend a listening ear or speak a gentle, encouraging word, or, or give a, a safe, affirming touch. Man, all those things just take encouragement to a whole nother level. But, but your very presence is an encouragement. And hey, I bring this verse to you, not to guilt you, but just to remind you that you really matter. Your physical presence really matters. We'd love to have you with us. And boy, all of us, when we come together, we want to come with like real presence. We're not just bodily showing up. We're present heart and soul. We're attentive. We're aware. We're engaged. That's the kind of presence that really encourages a body. And we all have a part to play in that. Here, here's just one more. One more great verse on this. Romans 15. 
Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Okay, gospel doctrine gives us encouragement, endurance, and hope. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. That's gospel culture. And what an interesting link between the word that gives us hope and the welcome that embodies it, that so encourages and gives people the faith and the hope to endure. It's really, I mean, that's the kind of just a simple gospel culture thing. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. And that's the real kicker. Jesus doesn't just give us a wave and say hi to us as we walk through the doors. Jesus welcomes us with lavish love. And we approach him not in our Sunday best, but when we come the way we really are, we just come broken and needy. And Jesus just throws his arms around us like the father did with the prodigal son. And when you think about how radical that is, I mean, compare that to the way sometimes I know I can react toward people. I mean, like, when Jesus sees you coming, does he ever go like, oh, geez, him again? Here comes Mr. Needy. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't look for an exit strategy or someone else to talk to so he doesn't have to deal with me and my mess. No, he welcomes me with open arms. He's like, welcome, my brother. You've come to the right place. Cast all your cares on me because I care for you. And he might even whisper, it's like, I don't know why all the rest of these people are trying to act like they got it all together. They should be coming the way you are. You're doing a great thing here. I love it. Now, let's talk about where you're at and where we can go together. Jesus welcomes us that way. What if we welcomed one another like that? Philip Yancey uh, wrote a a great illustration of this years ago uh, in an article called Lessons from Rock Bottom. He's looking at AA and, and the magic of it. He says, we in the church have as much to learn from people in the recovery movement as we might have to offer them. I was struck by one observation from an alcoholic friend of mine. When I'm late to church, people turn around and stare at me with frowns of disapproval. I get the clear message that I'm not as responsible as they are. When I'm late to AA, the meeting comes to a halt and everyone jumps up to hug and welcome me. They realize that my lateness may be a sign that I almost didn't make it. When I show up, it proves that my desperate need for them won out over my desperate need for alcohol. Oh, let's welcome each other in that spirit. Who knows what mighty challenges might have kept a person away, but here they are showing their devotion to the fellowship and let's meet them with the gospel culture that they and we alike are so hungry for. Now, let me just close up with a really brief and practical word about a place that we're creating where gospel doctrine and gospel culture are going to meet. By God's grace, it's going to be rich. Discovery Bible Groups. I want to invite you. They start this Wednesday night at both campuses. Go online, and, and if you don't have a small group yet, or if, if you're new to our church, maybe you're not even a Christian yet, or you're new to the faith, you're just not connected maybe, this is especially for you. A Discovery Bible Group. We're going to open God's Word together, and I promise you, even if you've never studied the Bible before, you're going to have something to contribute. Nobody's coming into this with like a bank of knowledge and showing up uh, and showing off. We're all coming with a beginner's mind together. And we're just going to see what God says to us, his gracious words of life. And we're going to do it in such a way with a kind of gentleness and a humility and a respect for each other that the ethos, the gospel culture that we so yearn for, it's going to characterize our groups together. Again, if you don't have a small group, I encourage you to come out and taste and see that the Lord is good and it'll be good to all of us together. Well, hey, I've given so much credit to Ray Ortland for various aspects of this sermon, so I'm just going to close with a quote from him. He says, The need of our times is nothing less 
than the re-Christianization of our churches, according to the gospel alone, in both doctrine and culture, by the Spirit of Christ Himself. And may we all say yes and amen and say, Lord Jesus, re-Christianize me and our church and our community as a result. Amen. God be with you this week. Thanks for being a part of our service today. And if you're new to Willowdale Online, or if you've been tuning in for a while, we want you to know that we would love to see you in person. And we gather as a church family every Sunday at both campuses, 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you're considering coming for the first time in person, you can plan your visit by clicking the I'm New button on our website. If you let us know that you're coming, we'll have somebody here to greet you and to show you around. I also want to encourage you to download our Willowdale app. It's the best way to know of all the opportunities and events coming this fall for you to get better connected into our community. And I leave you with the words of the Apostle Paul. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for being with us.